Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron. I'm uh, here for this uh, third Sunday in Advent. Um, our Bible text is from Revelation 1. I'll be quoting that extensively. I'm also going to be using uh, a poem from T.S. Eliot, The Cultivation of Christmas Trees, and I'll put that a uh, recording of that in the comments. Um, and I'll be quoting from that extensively. It's beautiful. I encourage you to listen to it. But uh, for my sermon, I'm going to hearken back to uh, December 24th, 2013. My wife, Lynn, and I were in Mariupol, Ukraine. Yes, that Mariupol, the one that was horrendously destroyed by Russia this year. In 2013, it was more of a sleepy industrial town trying to duck the political chaos happening in other parts of the country. Lynn and I were walking through a park on the way to an orphanage where we had been meeting with a seven-year-old named Victor. We were hoping to adopt him and bring him home with us to the United States. It didn't work out, and I've come to accept that I will never nearly really know why it didn't work out. And I wonder where Victor, now age 16, is. I pray he is safe and happy. But I really want to tell you about walking through that park on the way, on December 24th. It was the first Christmas I had ever spent out of the country. And by the way, Ukraine doesn't celebrate Christmas until 12 days after December 25th. So while there were a few decorations up, there wasn't the kind of anticipation you'd expect on the day before Christmas in the US. It was also the first Christmas in 15 years that I had no pastoral responsibilities. And here was the key learning for me. I was swept up in the realization that this was the first Christmas that I was completely in the present moment. I was not trying to recreate anything from my childhood or my family of origin. I was not trying to create anything about the future because the future was wide open. I would either have a son or I would not. And in that moment, I did not know. It was actually a moment of perfect freedom. I felt that God was with me no matter what happened. It was a sunny day and I was walking through a lovely park with my beloved and God was with us. I was certain of that. Now, of course, none of that shielded me from the tears that flowed freely over the next 24 hours. God doesn't shield us from tears, at least not in the world as it is now. But God was with me through the tears. I could feel it. This is how we experience God between the advents. We are those who live after the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, but do not live in that blessed time of the new heaven and the new earth promised in Revelation 21. Listen to the astonishing good news from verses 3 and 4 of that chapter. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And we, my friends, live in between the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and his second coming, which comes with the recreation of the world in Revelation 21. I think T.S. Eliot could relate to what I'm saying. There is a feeling of comfort about Christmas, but also a feeling of dissatisfaction. No matter how lovely the occasion, no matter how many smiling faces of family, no matter how well the food and preparations have turned out, no matter how pleasant it all is, there is still something missing. The overachieving hostess will take it all on herself. If only the centerpiece had been better or the turkey a little moister. But that isn't it. No earthly efforts, no matter how well-intentioned or perfectly executed, will dispel this sense that something is missing. Worldly efforts will not suffice because what is missing is not of this world. At some instinctive level, we long, what we long for is that complete intimacy of God, which has been promised. 
if Advent is the sense of the kingdom of God being at hand, then Advent and Christmas awaken in us a sense, an anticipation of God's coming. We get an aroma, a taste. We see it as though through a blurry window pane. It is this sense of God that I tuned into that morning in Mariupol. I could do it because I was away from the distractions of my past and had almost no control over my future. There was God and there was Lynn and we were being faithful and there was no success or failure, just faith. No trappings of Christmas, just Christ, the Son of God. Children get this at some instinctive level, and T.S. Eliot captures it so perfectly in the poem. To the children, the candle is a star. To the children, the figure at the top of the tree is not an ornament, but an angel. The child wonders at the Christmas tree. Let them continue in the spirit of wonder. At the feast, as an event not accepted as a pretext, lost in the glittering rapture, the amazement. And all these Christmases from childhood have a cumulative effect. I continue quoting Eliot. So that before the end, the 80th Christmas, and by 80th, whichever is last, the accumulated memories of annual emotion may be concentrated into a great joy, which shall also be a great fear on the occasion when fear came out of every soul, because the beginning shall remind us of the end and the first coming of the second coming. That really is quite beautiful. The first advent prior to the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem should remind us of the second advent, the second coming of Christ, which we await and long for. We don't know much about the person who wrote Revelation all we know for sure is three facts. His name was John. He had been exiled to a not great island near Greece called Patmos, and he had a fantastic vision from God. Now, this John did not see things of God through a blur. The vision given from God yielded a much deeper, more powerful experience. He saw so much that he must have been overwhelmed his head swirling with the sound and the majesty of it all. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God in the vision, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the Lord God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, and recreator. Revelation 21 will speak of a new heaven and a new earth. It will be like the old one, only better. That quality is what is missing from all our earthly Christmases. It is the underlying sense of disappointment every Christmas of our adult life. But in that time that John foresaw, it will no longer be missing. It will be fully present. Oh, so very present. The first advent makes the second advent possible. Let me reread a few verses from Revelation 1. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. This second coming will be such a profound event that it cannot be ignored. This world and everyone in it will be changed. Some will wail on account of him. Some Bibles say they will mourn. They will be cut by it. They cannot avoid it. They will come face to face with their judge, as will we all. And then we will realize it. The thing we long for is not benign, and it certainly isn't bland. 
It is powerful beyond measure. And its love is powerful beyond measure. Its judgment is sure. We humans who are not God will appear before the one human who is God, Jesus the Christ. We cannot live up to his standards, but we will experience his love and his grace. He is, as verse 6 says, him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. There will be fear, yes, but it is the kind of fear that is mingled with anticipation, hope for something much better better than we have had to content ourselves with until that time. And so, just as a pregnant woman longs for the birth to happen, so we wait for that time to come impatiently. I love the way Paul talks about this in Romans 8, to 25, where he says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they've already seen? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. This is what Advent is about, my friends. The waiting for the good stuff. Joyous at the birth of a child, but waiting for the whole world to change when he comes again. And so I wish you a happy Advent. Amen.